how much of the world sees Africa. Hunger. Horror. Hardship. This is how many Africans see Africa. Promising. Peaceful. Prosperous. Why is there a disconnect? Africa is a diverse continent of 54 different nations. So how do you capture the full truth about the African experience? This week, we take a closer look at Africa's image through the eyes of its own people and how they're countering negative stereotypes at home and abroad. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. We begin this week with Beyonce. When the international superstar recently dropped her visual album Black is King, it was seen by some as an homage to her African heritage, but not everyone saw it that way. To be one and the same, and still unlike any other. Life is a set of choices. Does your father know you are here? Lead. I laugh in the face of danger. Or be led astray. Run away. The musical film is meant to be a remake of Disney's The Lion King, but it's reignited a long-running debate about the problematic portrayals of African cultures. Unlike any other. Black is King is a new visual album and musical film directed, executive produced, and written by American singer-songwriter Beyonce. The film stands alongside her album, The Lion King, The Gift. It was shot last year in the US, South and West Africa, and Europe, and features many African artists. The film, released in July, has been generally well-received by audiences, but it does have its critics. Some say that Beyonce, who was born in the U.S. city of Houston, in Texas, is guilty of cultural appropriation for using African imagery throughout the work without having any specific cultural roots to the continent. On one side, you have people who are talking about how it's amazing artistry and how she was able to take her platform to expand this uh, to the entire world, to the globe. But I mean, of course, on the other side, there were many prevalent critiques that came out of this. The issue of just like this monolithic portrayal of Africa as a whole, facial drawings and imagery and animal prints. And I think that um, some people, you know, were tweeting and talking about when do we get away from this representation of Africa in this regard? I think generally the whole theme of, of Black is King is talking about um, the portrayal of Black people on the African continent as royalty. But as one Burundian writer put it, she was basically questioning that idea of saying, uh, we talk a lot about uh, pre-colonial Africa when it comes to kingdoms and uh, chieftainships and, and monarchies. Uh, but one thing that we don't talk about is the realities uh, that some of these kingdoms also, of course, had issues of slavery, imperialism, women oppression. And so when we talk about your lineage when it comes to the African continent, um, it is hard to, to kind of put that into perspective but understanding that not everybody could have been royalty. But in South Africa, those involved in the production were thrilled. On me, on my side, I really, really like liked the film. I really loved the film. It went into a lot of things that we haven't been told in, in, our, in our schools about Black history. And where, when, when like I saw the film, that's when I started to see that um, the stories and the attires and outfits that she was putting. While the film is not widely available on the continent, South Africa's largest cable provider made it available to premium subscribers. Student filmmaker Matibula says Beyonce's film inspired him to work on his own project, to tell more African stories. On one thing, her African supporters agree. If black is king, Beyonce is the queen. Anita Powell, VOA News, Johannesburg. So what do you think? Did Beyonce get it right? Did she get Africa wrong? Or both? You can find us on social media. Our handle is at VOAR Voices. And you can also send us a message on WhatsApp. That is our number right there on your screen. Daily news coverage is an important channel for shaping the way the world sees African countries. But can the news media do better? inside Africa and throughout the world. I reached out to Patrick Gattara. He's a Kenyan journalist and commentator. I asked him why we should care what the world thinks about the African continent. 
Um, we need to interact with other people. We need some of the resources that they have, just as they need some of the stuff that we do. Um, and in that sense, it's important for them to have an accurate um, impression of what goes on here. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to paint everything as uh, hunky-dory, there are no problems, hakuna matata, and all of that. Um, it's really important that we come across as human beings, that they start seeing us as like them, prone to error, with mistakes, but also with successes, with history, with cultures. It's not just that they stereotype us, we stereotype them. What's lacking is a medium that's honest enough to engage as human beings, rather than simply either black or white or, you know, without the labels. Lots of us, unfortunately, tend to see the continent of Africa through the eyes of um, uh, people in the West. Uh, if I take Kenya as an example, um, we don't have many Kenyan correspondents you know, in other parts of Africa who are feeding us news. So I think one of the more important things is rather than fighting for space within Western media, it would be to develop our own capacities within the continent to tell our own stories. Why do we need somebody from the U.S. coming here and reporting about Kenya or going to, the, to South Africa and reporting about South Africa? You know, why can't the South Africans explain what's going on themselves? I'm not one of those people who hope for sort of positive news. What I want is truthful news. A lot of times what we get tends to be devoid of nuance, devoid of context. You know, um, events are not really put in a historical context. And so when somebody who's not familiar with them hears them, um, um, all they get is sort of one-sided views. I asked Katara whether the aim is for Africa to be seen as a collection of very different countries that happen to be on one continent or a pan-African collective of countries that have a similar continental identity. Take African, for example, as a label. Before colonialism, nobody on this, on this continent thought of themselves as an African. You know, that is something that was imposed upon us, a box that we were put in to differentiate us from the people who came, you know. So we've got to start understanding when we can adopt particular identities, when we can use them, and when they're actually not really helpful for us. This idea of Pan-Africanism, of almost a cultural or mystical unity, is something that came from outside the continent. You know, Pan-Africanism was developed really by people in the diaspora and then reimposed on the continent as if, you know, people in uh, Kenya or what became Kenya are similar or the same as people in what is known as Nigeria. You know, we on the continent know this is not true. So if we do want a unified continent, and let's assume we sit down and we agree that that is something that uh, is desirable, we've got to ask why is it desirable? What are its goals? We, we have been conditioned to regard uh, places uh, where you come from it, you see, as definitive of what you are. You are an African, you are European. What happens if we ignore these um, um, assumptions, these barriers, these boxes? You know? And I think then we would actually start having better discussions and start seeing one another in better ways. And that was Kenyan journalist and commentator Patrick Gathara speaking to me from Nairobi, Kenya. After the break, we stay in that country as we look through the lens of a Kenyan photographer who says Africa's stories are all about colour, contrast and context. Stay with us. is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues, it's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories and our voices will help shape the next generation. You're with our voices, welcome back. 
One way to reframe the way people, places, and cultures on the African continent are viewed is through imagery. So we dropped in on a Kenyan photographer during one of her shoots in Nairobi. She says the perfect picture is about tone, texture, color, and context. That's why her focus is on Africa's women. My name is Tandiwe Moreo, a photographer based in Nairobi, Kenya. I describe my work as unapologetically African because I want to celebrate the positive things about being an African. So often our continent is projected as this poor place full of suffering and we're not perfect but there's so many beautiful things about Africa and I want to celebrate those in my work. I think what's missing from the narrative about Africa and its people is our voice. So often we've had so many other people come to tell our story. I think it's one thing to have our story told by somebody from outside our context, but there's things that we see that they may not necessarily see because we live here, we have community here. I think now is an exciting time to be an African because we're really owning our voice. Before we were shy, a little scared maybe to talk about what to celebrate ourselves and I'm so excited to be part of the movement that's happening now where everybody is beginning to wake up and look around them and say we have so much to celebrate we have so much to contribute and share with the continent and the world recently in my work I have been drawn to our history um, as Kenya and Africa in general, looking at what kind of traditional hairstyles did we have, what kind of traditional clothing did we have, and taking those elements and modernizing them and adding the pop of color that I have in my work and making modern nods to history. It's amazing how much beauty there is just in this one continent, um, all the way from South Africa, all the way up you can just find such different features, such different hair, such different skin tones. I remember growing up as a child, I always felt frustrated. Why is my hair not longer? Why is my nose not more narrow? Why are my lips so big? And it took me a while as a photographer to realize, hold on, there's nothing wrong with me. And I want to pass that message to other women through my work, that you are beautiful with your short hair. You're beautiful with your big lips. You're beautiful with a larger nose. There's nothing wrong with those things. And in fact, those are what make us unique and beautiful. When I finished university, I was feeling pressure to be what every African parent wants their child to be, a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. And I really struggled with the question of, can I do photography for the rest of my life? Fortunately, my father had coffee with me one day and he told me, why are you considering other jobs? You love photography, so be a photographer. And it was the most liberating conversation I've ever had in my life. I think just because of all the stereotypes around being an artist in Africa, I was afraid to go for it. And having that conversation released me to truly enjoy exploring my photography. I think as women, we have something unique to offer the art world. We see things differently. We appreciate beauty in a different way from men. And so I hope that hearing my story is what will drive a girl somewhere in Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, to say, you know what? I want to be a photographer when I grow up. Photographer Tandiwe Moreau there in Nairobi, Kenya. Identity is about more than how we look. It's also about what we say. And control of our narrative is as important as control of our image. That's the area of expertise of Mimi Kalinda. She's the co-founder and CEO of Africa Communications Group. She says in many cases, social media has given Africans a global platform and a wider range to tell our own stories. We've always known that we are more than what we're portrayed to be. So we didn't necessarily need the convincing, but I think what was lacking was perhaps the tools 
to be able to access this global stage and be able to tell our own story. And I think that social media has played a huge role in that. You've seen trending hashtags and sometimes people, ordinary people, challenging the narrative of a big global corporate, you know, multimedia uh, companies and saying, no, that's not how you should speak about us. Or no, actually that, that, that title is skewed or whatever. You know, I think that there's just been so much activism towards this reshaping of our own narrative. It's very, very encouraging. So I think that the narrative that we're trying to tell, that, the, that we want to tell, is a narrative that is fundamentally true, that it's going to be credible even from an ethical point of view, is to say, you know, yes, we have all of these things that we do really, really great and the world should know about them. But then there's also this bucket of challenges that we have as a continent. And in order for us to meet those standards, we need to raise our own standards in terms of how we show up um, as, as, as a solution bearers or problem solvers. I have a responsibility, you have a responsibility, we all have a responsibility to contribute to this narrative change, but we also have a responsibility to learn about our own continent, you know? How do you go about shaping a narrative or changing a narrative if you yourself don't know where you come from, what's your history, you know, what's the background of your own people, um, et cetera, in your own backyard, but also on a continental stage? Kalinda says to watch out for the term women's empowerment. It's often not as empowering as you might think. Um, if we're talking about empowerment, it assumes that somebody else has the power and that they have to, to, to then come, come and give it to us. So we're putting ourselves in, a, in almost a, a place of victimization, which I completely disagree with. These narratives that, that talk about us in a way that's not representative of, of who we are. And, and one of the, those narratives is that women, African women in particular, don't help each other climb the corporate ladder. The major opportunities that I've had in my career, in my life, um, and, and in my fi family life even, you know, I've, I've raised three children on my own, wouldn't have done it without the support of other women in my circle. We have to fight that divisiveness uh, that's so sown amongst us by the narratives that are, that are, I feel, implanted in our midst and that we then end up buying into. So when you walk into a boardroom and you see another woman of color, you almost go on the defensive and you think to yourself, well, you know, I don't know if she's really going to open doors for me. Why not? I think that those are the little things that we need to start looking at and questioning. And, and I think that once we start to do that, we, we will realize that, in fact, there's no empowerment to be done. We already have the power. That was Mimi Kalinda, the CEO and co-founder of Africa Communications Group, speaking to me from Johannesburg, South Africa. After the break, we meet the Nigerian man who is building a digital library to help African children think differently about their future and themselves. And we'll also take you to Paris as we follow in the footsteps of writers and singers of African descent who made their mark in history. Don't say we don't take you anywhere. We'll be right back. You're with our voices, welcome back. Now, many women will tell you as young girls, they heard their fair share of fairy tales about a princess finding her prince and living happily ever after in a faraway place. Well, we spoke to a 23-year-old Nigerian man who's behind a digital collection of African children's stories. And we must warn you, he's not a fan of Prince Charming. Medina Maishanu has more. Dominic Onyekachi tells us that when he saw his six-year-old niece reading, he knew that there was something important missing, her African story. That is when he decided to do something about it. I went to a mini library and I discovered that not only were the stories there old, they were not representative. The characters they had there, they didn't have her hair, skin color, or they didn't look like her, or they didn't live in places she was familiar with and because she was born in Nigeria and she grew up in Nigeria. So. I felt like children her age should have access to better stories, to more representative stories. 
So the first thing I did was to team up with one of my co-founders. So we decided that um, we should build a platform to allow um, children of color, no matter where they might be in the world, to be able to access these kind of stories. So that was when I met with Panan and we built the platform called Akidi. It's a web-based platform that allows children to have access to African content or African-themed children's books uh, at the click of a button instantly. Onyekachi says the platform will give children in Africa and around the world an insight into Africa's beauty and complexity. The ability to encounter the multiple cultures that make up Africa in a full and a narrative way. That is what we try to do with stories. We introduce them to a world that is complex, that is diverse, but that is also strong and proud in heritage and history. But a lot of these new stories are stories that are written for children of today because we do realize that even with African stories, some African stories might be sexist, uh, might be half. Um, slight undertones that we do not want and uh, some older African stories might be sexist or have like slight undertones we do not necessarily think are important or inclusive enough for a world of today. So you see a book like Bubu Slide now. Bubu Slide reimagines what a fairy tale can look like. It talks about the story of a poor boy that um, encounters a dog that becomes his friend and the dog gives him a new outlook on life. But you look at the story and you find out that um, we are incorporating a lot of themes we felt that children should be thinking about in the 21st century. We talked about recycling, we talked about entrepreneurship, and we talked about conservation all in one story. But So my hope is that if um, children, especially black children, are able to like find inspiration in one of the characters I create and decide that they are going to do something in the world as important as what that character did, I'm going to be fulfilled. That's like my vision. So that's why I try to use technology to make sure that as many children in the world as possible can see what we do and maybe decide to aspire to be something greater than um, what they are seeing around them. And that's exactly what I want to do. Onyekachi says the digital library will keep growing. In their next project, they are looking to future robots with African stories that will focus on science, technology, engineering, and math. Medina, thank you very much. Now to Paris, one of the world's top tourist destinations. This city is home to many, many people of African descent who over decades have helped shape important parts of Parisian culture. But not everyone gets to see that. Earlier this year, I traveled to the French capital and joined a tour group as they explored this hidden history. These Parisian women are about to see a unique part of their own city, Black Paris. Hello everybody, good morning and welcome to... Julia Brown is the tour guide. Brown has studied the stories of African Americans who came here to escape racism at home. She maps out a walking tour back in time to Paris's famous Rive Gauche, or Left Bank, where renowned American artists and intellectuals settled in the 20th century. Among them, novelist Richard Wright and entertainer Josephine Baker, the only two African Americans memorialized in Paris. We have history here. There are roots here for us where we don't have roots elsewhere. It means that people that are thinking that Africa is the only place that they, they can link back to, no, there's a stop here. Because this is a place where other diaspora members came together and it was an ideal place. So we're in an ideal spot to rediscover and to learn about our history here. Josephine Baker took Paris by storm in the 1920s, breaking into show business with her performance in the musical show La Revue Negre. At the time, she had become the biggest black female star in the world. Outside the restaurant Baker once owned, Brown tells us the singer's fame also sparked deep cultural questions. This is the show poster. You know that they've got in their mind black minstrels, right? So when Josephine Baker is part of this show, she represents the epitome of what the French think is black beauty at the time. She defines, redefines what is black beauty? But it's a question she asks herself, what does it mean to be black? Baker's story resonates with tour participant Ursuline Kersen, who moved here from the US and performs where Baker once did. Mm. 
mon pays est Paris. Parles-tu je mon cœur est ravi. Ma savane est belle. The tour moves to Paris's Latin Quarter. Brown takes us to the apartment where American novelist Richard Wright once lived. This area is called the Brains of Paris, and here... Born in Mississippi, Wright wrote about poverty, politics, and race relations in America and beyond. His work brought him global recognition and unwanted attention, according to his granddaughter, who is also on the tour. He had traveled a lot and he had spoken a lot about the American question, the American race question, but it uh, made him very much watched by secret services, intelligence agencies. And everything. Wright reportedly died of a heart attack in 1960. To his family, it's a mystery. We don't think his death was a natural death. Anyway, he lives on in the streets of Paris, and especially here. Brown hopes visitors to black Paris find lasting connections to important history and to those who made it. The influence, the global influence of African-American culture that is still here and all around the world, what does that feel like? Because it sure doesn't feel like when you're in the States, it feels different, but when you're in here and there's a value to it, that feeling is what they felt in the 1920s, what they felt in the 50s, what they feel now. A feeling familiar to diasporans past and present, that home and history can be found in more than one place. I can't deny that to both I am true. To love's have I, mon pays. What an experience. And that is our show this week. Thank you so much for being with us. Of course, we've just scratched the surface on the subject. We'd like to hear from you as we look to continue this discussion again in the future. We leave you now with a song that has become a global phenomenon from my home country of South Africa, Master KG featuring Nom Trebo. This is a song that has people around the world dancing to an African beat. Here is Jerusalem. Jerusalem, 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 J